This morning, I want to pick up on the series on sexuality. Uh, and you might be wondering, why are we uh, going into this series on sexuality? By the way, Pastor Kurt did a great job last Sunday. Well done, Pastor Kurt. If, uh, if you missed last week's, please could I ask you to watch it because it's a foundation to build on this week. You might be wondering, why are we doing sexuality? Uh, isn't that just a problem in the first world with No, it's a problem here. I remember when the Lord called me out of the hotel business to go into ministry, to work in in Baban and in Sunduza on the streets, and and God called me to work with um, the children that were on the streets. You know, at that time, of the first 15 children that we were caring for on the streets, 14 of them tested HIV positive out of 15. 14 out of 15. And all of them had been hurt on the streets. They weren't hurt in their homes, they were hurt on the streets in Imabar. I remember hearing this, uh, the welfare had called me directly and asked me if we could help this um, young girl of four years old. I remember getting the call distinctly. And uh, the welfare officer was really despondent because this four-year-old girl, mom and dad had died and uh, The uncle had taken care of her, but the uncle had serious challenges. Um, And he had taken this little four-year-old girl and put her naked on a hot stove. I won't give you the details of what he did with the cigarettes, the cigarette butts. And um, I, I would ask you the question, the pain that that little girl experienced, and could you really expect her to trust to trust any authority thereafter. And um, as I share that with you, I I, I recognize the need that we need to recognize that all of us have experienced pain in the area of sexuality. The truth is, in Eswatini, one in three young ladies under the age of 18 have reported gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is very high. And so let's recognize it's not just out there that there's a problem. We have a problem here. And we need to, as a church family, we need to be more vigilant because we just, we naively just trust our children to walk down the roads to go to school, six, seven kilometers to school. And we, we let the teachers teach the children. How many of us as parents actually watch the education, go through the curriculum, do the homework with our children? How how many of us are vigilant about checking the homework? And what are they putting in the homework? What are they teaching our children? How many of us, I mean, I can go into La Vomisa, into the deepest, most rural areas in La Vomisa or Tlangano, and I can take, go in to visit a pastor. Tell your neighbor he's talking about the pastor. And I'll get there, and maybe the pastor hasn't got electricity, but he's got a television. He might not have electricity, but he'll have a television. And the television is connected to a battery, you know, those big batteries. And um, they, he's taken his child, and, and he, he puts his child in front of the television. The television is now, he's watching cartoons all day long whilst he's working. Have you noticed that? That we allow the television to raise our children. We allow Hollywood to raise our children. We allow the teachers to raise our children. But do we raise our children? Do we check what's going on? Because we need to recognize there's a lot of stuff that's being funded, sponsored, pushed into the education system that's impacting us. And as our purpose is to stop and pause for a moment in the series of sexuality and bring clarity through the Word of God, bring the clarity of the Word of God, and to bring compassion, revelation of God's love, And before I go into this series, I want to give thanks to CCV in Phoenix, Arizona, who gave us all the research material, gave us all their manuscripts so that we could use this to empower Potter's Wheel Church and us as a family to move forward. So let's go back to the two targets that we want to achieve today. First target is that you would know the love of God, that you would understand the compassion that God loves you, and that regardless of the situation, If I say something you disagree with, if I say something wrong, 
that you would still experience the love of God because he is love. Tell your neighbor, God is love. You know, if we are, if we are using the gifts of the Spirit but without love, it means nothing, right? First is love. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I pray that you would experience the love of God. But the second thing is, I really pray that you would get clarity of the truth of the word of God. Because it's not enough just to have love. Love without truth is not love. Love with truth. And love in truth. Because God is love and God is truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so as we go into this series, those are the two things we want to cover. Last week, Pastor Kurt introduced us magnificently to two ideologies that the world preaches. And the world system introduced us to this first one called expressive individualism, which means where the feelings that we have, the desires we have, become God over us. We allow our feelings and our thoughts, our desires to control us. So expressive individualism, a worldly term, says just do what you feel like. Your your feelings, your thoughts are your truth, so express yourself the way you want to feel. But the Word of God says in the book of Jeremiah, he says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? No man but God. God tells us you, you've got to understand that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. You can't just go with your feelings. You can't just go with your thoughts. The, word say, the world says Expressive individualism is right. The Word of God says, no, no, bring that into submission to the Word of God. The second one is, the second ideology is that um, sexuality is the core of our identity. That's what the world says. Sexuality is the core of our That The world's saying that you need to accept what my sexuality is, and that's my identity. They take a sex act and make that our identity. The first time in human history, they take an activity and allow that activity to define our identity. But the Word of God says that we are, we are defined in our identity by God. He fashioned us in our mother's womb. He set us apart with a plan and purpose. Our identity comes from Jesus Christ, not from the world. So with that covering the last week, we are now covering this week the title of gender dysphoria and the transgender movement. As we go into that, to get a sexual, an identity defined as God says in dealing with sexuality. The first thing I want to introduce you to is the world is teaching through the education system, not just out there in the first world, but also in South Africa and also in private schools in Eswatini funded to come into Eswatini. So as parents, please notice this. One of the things that teaches what the, the, the queer community are, have got out for us to see and to try and understand. I was trying to understand gender dysphoria. And so I was told, read about this. I'm sure you've heard of the gingerbread man. How many of you heard gingerbread man? We were raised on the gingerbread man. Well, what the queer community produced to try and explain it a little bit better was the gender person. The ginger, gender, the gender person. And this is what it looks like. And as we go into that, we see that the first thing that you should notice is the biological sex. And, and what that means in this gender person is that the biological sex refers to the physical sex characteristics with which you were born with. And then it goes to gender identity being the way you think, your brain. How you, in your brain, in your head, define your gender regardless of your biological identity. So the teaching in the world, not the word, in the world is that the brain has the freedom to define what the gender is despite the biological sex. And therefore, gender expression is how you want to express your gender through your, the way you dress, through your actions, or through your demeanor. Then it defines gender attraction, both romantic and sexual, as uh, where the person could be attracted to males or females or anything in between or no gender at all. 
There are endless combinations to this, and it's confusing. As I look at this, I find this very confusing, so I was trying to understand it. But ABC News reported a story of a mother of a 12-year-old who said this, some days Annie is a girl, and some days Annie is a boy, and some days she's both. When this mother took Annie shopping for graduation, they purchased both a dress and a suit because they weren't sure what gender Annie would identify when the day of graduation came. The mom goes on to say, Annie believes gender is more a mental trait than a physical trait. Do you remember the teaching is that's been taught that the brain and the thoughts define the body. And so she says mental trait rather than physical trait. This is confusing. I don't know about you, but as I've looked at the news and tried to look at different points, I've noticed that leading politicians, world-renowned academics, the brightest of the brightest of the people in the world system, when they are asked, what is a woman? Typically, their response is, I don't know what a woman is, or I cannot define a woman. I read this, a trans activist said this, a woman is an umbrella term. It's to each to their own. Each woman, each man, each person is going to have a different relationship with their own gender identity and define it differently. This is confusing. And yet, this is what's been taught in schools around the world. So much so that they've moved from the gender person to introducing into preschools and primary schools the gender unicorn so that it's more child-friendly, so that children can understand even more their thoughts. I want to remind you, this is in the South African school system, it's in the private school system in Eswatini, and it's been sponsored to come into our education system. As a pastor, I need to take you back to the word, because if I withhold the truth from you, I'm not loving you. Did God design us to be this confused sexually. Well, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, the word of God says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. God is not a God of confusion. In fact, he warns us where there's confusion, where there's every evil thing unto strife, unto witchcraft. So we need to understand where there's confusion, whenever there's mass confusion, we need to recognize God is not in that mass confusion because God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of peace. So I want to introduce to you a third ideology from the sexual revolution. And it's from the book, Love Thy Body by Nancy Piercy. She's an amazing author. That is a book that's well worth reading. She's a Christian and she puts it perspective she takes the world's view of personhood and breaks it down for us. You see, because the gender-bred teaching that the queer community and the international education system has brought in saying that the mind and the body are separate from each other, that they're not linked. Yet the Word of God says that He created us three in one. He said He formed us with body, mind, and spirit. When you have this split, according to the world side, the mind is, they say, who I am as a person. And then they say, but the body is simply raw material with no moral value to be shaped however you want. The body is how you really think, and the mind just raw material. It comes from Darwinian evolutionary thinking, which basically says God didn't create you, you evolved. 
And because you evolved from nothing, your body has no intrinsic value. Okay, so with that as the backdrop to understand that the world is teaching that the mind and the body are separate, I have three questions as a pastor I want to pose to us that we meditate on and compare to the Word. The first one is, what's God's view of my body? Let's, let's align correctly into God's thinking. Second, what does science say and how does that align with the Word of God? Third, if that's the case, how do we, how do we love people with gender dysphoria well? First question, what's God's view of my body? Because God's view of personhood is that the mind and the body is not separate. In fact, it's not separate, it's interconnected. In Genesis 1, 26, the word of God says, Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He created them male or female. Male or female. How many genders? Two. He created male or female. And he created them in his image. The truth is, God is the creator God. And, and think about this for a moment. I wonder why he created us male and female. Why did he create us male or female? When he could have created us genderless, he's God. He could have had us multiply by popping out of our big toe. Uh, he, he could have made us that we do not have to have a procreation between male and female to have life continue. He's God. But he designed us in such a way that we male or female. That's how he designed us. And he has it. He says he created us in his image, in the image of God. Some would argue if God made me male, then he made a mistake. Because I feel like, some people would say, I feel like I'm a woman trapped inside of a man's body, and therefore God made a mistake. But what does the word of God say? Did God make a mistake? In Psalm 139 verse 13, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He knit us together. The Hebrew term, term for knit us together means he took a lot of time and love and patience over putting us together. He was very intentional about making you, making me as he has. And some would say, okay, what about those with intersex then? What about those with, uh, who, have that, who have both male and female genitalia? Well, the truth is there are very rare times that people are born with male and female genitalia known as hermaphrodite. In fact, according to the National Library of Medicine, it happens as 0.018 times, 0.01% of the times. In other words, 99.98% of the time, it doesn't happen. Now, there are syndromes that occur, like Turner syndrome, like Klinefelter syndrome, that affects only males or only females. And there are these syndromes that happen. And, and some of you say, but how does that happen? Why, if God doesn't make a mistake, how does that happen? Well, I don't know, but I do know this. We live in a fallen world with fallen men. And fallen man has introduced pollutions, toxins, chemicals into our food, into our water, into our drink, and even into our environment that I can tell you will definitely be affecting us 
definitely even genetically affecting us as we continue to live. So I don't know how this happened exactly, but I do know that we live in a fallen world with fallen men. But how many other scenarios do we treat in the same light? For, for example, there's no other scenario that we treat a rare birth defect in the same terms. Think about this. If a child is born without an arm, we now don't inform medicine that because a child was born without an arm, that it's important to chop people's arms off. We don't do that, do we? Because this defect should not inform the doctors in terms of other children. And someone might be asking here this morning, why does God even care what I, what I do with my body? Because my body, it's my body. Leave it, it's my body. But listen to what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. I'm trying to show you first the world's view, science's view, and the Word of God's view. Look at the Word of God in verse 18. Flee from sexual morality. All other sins a person commits outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, some people are sitting there and saying, you see, that's my body. You said it's not my body, but look at this. It says sins against their own body, my body. So it's my body. Let's continue reading. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? In other words, your body is not your own. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you think it doesn't matter to God, listen for a little longer. He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Then he says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. With your bodies. Just say out loud with me, with your bodies. Can I ask you to say with me out loud, honor God with your bodies. So he's saying here, don't honor God just with your mind. Don't honor God with just with your soul, but honor God with your bodies as well. The world says your body is just raw material with no moral value. The word of God says your body is made in the image of God. Body, soul, and spirit, they are connected, interconnected. So with that said, the big question with the transgender movement is, but what I do then when my mind and my body at war with each other, at odds with each other, because my mind says this and my body is over here. BBC said it like this, at the heart of the debate about transgender children is the idea that your brain can be at war with your body. Remember, we, we talked about how the body, the transgender movement said the mind and the body are separate, they, and now they're at war with each other. But you know who else said they were at war with each other? Christians said it. Paul said it. Paul said that there's a war with each other. Listen to what he says in Romans 7, verse 22. Paul says, my inner beings delight in the law of God, but I see another law at work in my, in my body, warring, warring against the law of my mind. You see, there's a body, there's a mind, and they war. I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells in me. In other words, because of sin, there's a, law, a war going on between my body and my mind. This war that's going on between my body and my mind is a war against God's design. It's a war against God's design. Paul said it better when he said, my spirit is at war with my flesh and my flesh is at war with my spirit. Another translation says this, my spirit is contrary to my flesh and my flesh is contrary to my spirit. So it's not just in the area of gender dysphoria that there's a, a war going on. I would put it to you that there's a war going on in every human being 
with regards to, and especially with regards to, sexual desires and sexuality. I want to confess to you that even as a pastor, there's been times that my mind has been at war with my body in the area of sexual desires. The truth is that God's word says there's this war that goes on. But you must take your thoughts captive and submit it to Christ where you bring your thoughts and your feelings and submission to the word of God. There's a war. That's the war. That's the helmet of salvation. That's why he talks about putting on the armor of God because there is a war. That's why he says your fight isn't with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. The word of God says, and so let's just have a look at this. So many of us would say the following statement, and I think you would know this. Could you say it with me, please? How could something, how could something be so wrong that feels so right? Let's say it again. How could something be so wrong that feels so right? What do you do when your body and your mind are at war with each other? The world will say, the world will say, listen to your mind and alter your body. Listen to what your thoughts are. Let your truth be truth. Let your feelings be feel the truth. But the word of God says, let God transform your mind and embrace the body he gave you. That's the word of God. Listen to how clear this is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 in the New Living Testament. He says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let your bodies be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he'll find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. And the word holy means to be set apart, to be set apart, to make separate to the Lord. So how do you worship? You sacrifices, sacrifice your desires to his will. Don't listen to the world. Remember last week, Pastor Kurt said, the word teaches, the world teaches, the world teaches, express yourself. Let your truth be truth. Let your feelings be feelings. But the word of God says, through Jesus, he says, deny yourself, pick up the cross and follow me. There's a big difference between what the world says, and what the word says. Paul says it's like this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, is good, is pleasing, and is perfect will. Let's say it again. The world says, let your mind, listen to your mind and alter your body. The word says, let God transform your mind and embrace the body he gave you. Isn't it interesting that in the transgender movement, in the gender dysphoria movement, there is no discussion on transforming your mind. There's only a discussion on changing your body. Nancy Piercy wrote this in her book, Love Thy Body. He said, she said, why is it considered acceptable to carve up a person's body to match the inner sense of self? But it is bigoted to help them change their sense of self to match their body. Feelings can change, but the body is an observable fact that does not change. It makes sense to treat it as a reliable marker of gender identity. So what does science say? Second question. What does science say about this mind-body disconnect? Just imagine if you're this lovely, you're this doctor and this lovely 18-year-old girl walks into your practice. Imagine she's got anorexia. She should be weighing 50, 45, 50 kilograms. Instead, she comes into the room 
weighing 25 kilograms. She's this lovely young lady walking into the room weighing 25 kilograms and she's got anorexia. She sits down with the doctor in this doctor's practice and she says to this doctor, doctor, I'm sorry, but I feel overweight. I feel heavy. I feel fat. Please, doctor, uh, can you help me to lose more weight? Would you be a good doctor if you said, yes, sure, my dear, let me do liposuction. Let me do some carving up. Let me do some cutting. Let me, do, let me give you some medicines to treat you, to help you to lose further weight. Would you be a good doctor? No. You would then, as a good doctor, try and show her the reality of her body, of where her body is. You would not be helping her to give her treatment except to deal with anorexia. Why would it be so different if we are truly loving with gender dysphoria? One reason we need to recognize, though, why this is a dangerous area is, consider this, there's big money in selling hormone blockers, changes, in the operations, if you study how much money is needed to help a person to change from one gender to another gender, you'd, say, you'd see there's big money. So follow the money. The reality is to carve up and change the body is a permanent change. A permanent change. And what about the elephant in the room even today? The question is, do people with gender dysphoria ever change their minds? And the answer is yes, they do. Listen to Dr. Paul Mahew from John Hopkins University. When he said, when children who reported transgender feelings were tracked without medical or surgical treatment at both Funderbale University and London's Portman Clinic, 70 to 80 percent of them spontaneously lost their feelings. 70 to 80 percent. So why would families, parents, embrace their children wanting to change their gender so quickly? Well, they are told, if you don't let your beautiful daughter transition into being a young boy, he will like, she will likely commit suicide. They will even say something like this. You can either have a living son or a dead daughter. That's what happens. You can have a living son or a dead daughter. You can study studies and find actually the study after study after study after study is actually saying the suicide rate after change is much higher than before. In fact, the suicide rate after change is 20 times higher than before. There was one study that was done in Sweden that followed 324 people over 30 years. It's the most statistically valid study you'll find on this topic. And it found 10 years after surgery, there was 20 times the suicide rate compared to the general population. So to claim that altering the body or, or alternatively they will commit suicide is really a form of emotional terrorism. It's literally like me going to Helen and saying to Helen, Helen, you either need to accept me as um, a promiscuous, adulterous husband who needs to have lots of ladies on the side, or you'll have a dead husband. Guess which one Helen will choose. <laughs> you can either have a dead, monogamous husband or a promiscuous, adulterous husband. Which one are you going to have? <laughs> Uh, Helen would definitely choose, <laughs> anyway. But here's the sad part is, you cannot choose
to change your gender because your gender is always with you. Do you know you, you cannot scientifically change your gender because actually the chromosomes go down to every cell of your body, down to the molecular level. You're either speaking XX or XY. It's going down to, down to your lungs, to your heart, to your skin. It goes even down to your skin. It's sh your skin is literally saying XX or XY. Do you know that when you go in for surgery and they're going to put you under anesthetic, the doctors have to know which are you, XX or XY. Before they treat you, before they give you anesthetic, they need to know that. And so even down at a molecular level, they need to know. But if we define sex and gender, define sex and gender without biology, how do we define it? If, if gender is taken out and is no longer hinged to biology, how do you define it? Just think about that for a moment. If you take gender and sex out of it from biology and you say, okay, now we're going to define women and men, how? That's why it's confusing. That's why the person said it's an umbrella term for whatever you define it as. But the fact is, and this is the sad part for me as a pastor, the sad part is that if you're not going to define it with biology, then you're going to find, define it by stereotypes. And a good example of this to show how news and media uh, portrayed this is the famous person, Bruce Jenner. He was an athlete who won the 1976 Olympic Games in the decathlon and he married into the Kardashian family, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Kardashian family. And then from the Kardashian family, he began his transition. And the media broadcasted the news of this change in this way. The question I have for you is, is this really what a woman is? Woman of the year. So, so the woman is here. Yeah, just have a look at the stereotyping that's going on. The stereotyping is long curly hair, large cleavage, the shape that it is, the body is. I, I want to ask you the question, if gender is only defined by peer appearance, then what is it defined by? And I would put it to you, the media defines it by stereotyping. The problem is it doesn't eliminate stereotyping, it magnifies stereotyping. Many women's rights activists have commented that this photo, actually, this picture, took women's right back 50 years. Think about it. Because what that does is it speaks into the stereotype. But what about if you are not a cleavage-boosting, skin-showing, sultry-posed female with thick mascara, lipstick, and curled hair? Does that mean that you're a man? Or if you're a scrawny or big muscular man and you don't like football and you're more into the arts, you're more into poetry, does that make you feminine? If you're a woman that loves football and fast cars and movies like Gladiator, does that make you a man? No, I think good on you like Gladiator. <laughs> mm. Women in particular have been hurt by the stereotyping. Think about how this means that men can go into women's change rooms. This means that, and this is happening, that men who have been caught in a, in a criminal act in, in the first world are actually now suddenly identifying as women so that they can go into the women's prison. That's what's happening. But without a definition of male or female based on biology, all you have is stereotypes. And the biggest victims of the transgender movement are actually women and children. So if gender isn't the biology, what isn't the definition linked to biology, then what is? It's called childhood gender nonconformity. The biggest issue for defining people is childhood gender nonconformity, that during childhood, a young person feels like they're different to their peers around them. In other words, they are stereotyped, they are labeled. And it's our stereotypes, our labels, that hurts them. 
It's young girls being told they're tomboys, that they're boys. They're young boys being told because they're feminine, they're gay. Labeling people is dangerous and it can be cruel. I can remember that even when I was at school and I was at an all boys boarding school, in this all boys boarding school, sadly, children can be cruel, can't they? And when we got to this all boys boarding school, you know, if you weren't on the rugby team, if, if, you, if you were belonging to the choir, yo, there was, they, you were different. And uh, what was promoted was you had to be in the rugby team, in the cricket team, in the hockey team, and, and you better not belong to the choir and you better not love the arts. We stereotyped and we had to repent of that. And good news, the school years later came back and said, the way we deal with this is from now on, if you're on the first rugby team, you have to be in the choir. Praise God. Yes. And I just want to pause and ask you, if you have come into this church and ever felt you've been labeled, stereotyped by us, please forgive us. It's not right. But what, that's what we do, not the church, but mankind does that. I was reading from Christopher Yun, and as a parent, can I just advise you, if you're trying to work out how to parent your child, Christopher Yun has an amazing site called Holy Sexuality. I'll put it up at the end for parents to know about. Now, Christopher Yun struggled with same-sex attraction, and he says, all through grade school and into college, I was sensitive, I was nerdy, I was horrible at sports, I loved music and arts, and I was never fully accepted. Because the children stereotyped him and labeled him. There's another site by a guy called Cy Rogers, felt the same way at primary school, at middle school, at high school. He was labeled. And yet, if we look at it, consider David, King David. He wrote the Psalms. He loved poetry. He wrote poems. And by the way, he liked to dance. He even danced naked before his friends, half naked. Are we saying that he's feminine? And then there's Deborah who went into rough and tumble she, she led the whole military to come against the enemy. She led as the general of the army. God has made us all different and unique. And we need to stop stereotyping. The third thing is, so the question then is, how do we minister more effectively to those with gender dysphoria? And in this, the first thing and the most important thing is that we love one another. Tell your neighbor, love one another. Jesus said this. He said that we are told a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. We are not to ridicule one another. We are not to mock one another. We're not to label one another. In fact, God wants us to have the prophetic gift of seeing people as God sees them and calling out the promises, calling out the talent, calling out the calling on those people's lives. He desires us to have the prophetic gift. We are to love one another. The second thing is we are to submit our thoughts and our feelings to God's word. As a church, we are commanded, we are commanded to guide everyone back into the word of God. I hear you feel like this. What does the word of God say? We are called to disciple one another with the word of God. And let me remind you as I end, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, the word of God says this, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that, is, that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, God's body. You know, remember he was on the cross and they're mocking him, they're in sin, they're mocking him. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Talk about compassion. 
but the body is not ours, it's God's. Romans 12 verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I invite the worship team up and can I ask you to stand? And as you stand, thank you for being the church that you are. You know, when I walk it into church this morning, in the second service, I really felt the love of God here. I felt the love of God on you. And as a father of this church, I'm very proud of what God is doing in each and every one of us, that you are a church that loves and loves well. Amen. Thank you. And I thank you that you're a church that doesn't just accept the love of God and receive the love of God and walk in the love of God, but you've got the balance of walking in the truth of the word. Love without the truth isn't love. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's truth with the word. And as you stand here this morning, can I ask if we can read this scripture together? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Let's read together. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In Jesus' name. Can I ask if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads and just closing your eyes. You know, when I became a young Christian, God had me repent of my stereotypes. Somehow, children are cruel. When you go to school, primary school, even pre-primary school, primary school, high school, university, and we allow the world, we allow the television, we allow media to shape our stero stereotyping. And suddenly we are labeling others. And as a church, I believe that we need to repent. Repent of stereotyping. Repent of labeling. If you recognize that you've been stereotyping, been labeling people, maybe you've been saying, hey, that guy's just a conservative Christian over the top, square peg. It's just a square peg. That's labeling. Maybe, maybe you look at a person and say, hey, that person's different, different. Yes, it's labeling. We're all different. We're all unique. God is telling us to step out of the world way into the Word's way. And I believe it starts with us repenting of looking at people and judging them, stereotyping them, labeling them, instead of loving them through the Word of God. And so if you recognize today, eyes closed, if you recognize you've been stereotyping, can I ask you just to put up your hand before God? Amen. Amen. Okay, can you slip your hands down? Father, we ask for forgiveness, for stereotyping, for judging. We come back to the feet of the cross and we thank you that you paid the price. That we would love, receive love and love well. We also, also ask for forgiveness for just leaving television to raise our families. Leaving teachers to raise our families. Leaving the community to raise our families when in fact you've called us to train up our children in the way of the Lord, to be disciple, to know the love and the truth of God. We ask you for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And we recognize we have been hurt, and so we hurt others by labeling them instead of loving them in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go into this worship song, 
And I invite you at this time to take opportunity just to kneel before the altar of the Lord and repent of stereotyping people, of labeling people. It's a time of just healing. Stepping out of the world's way, not being conformed by the world, but being transformed by the word. Can I ask if we can repent before God? And then we're going to go into a time of just doing Holy Communion, just realigning back to God's truth in Jesus' name. Let's worship him and kneel before him.